What were we talking about? I don't remember. Uh, oh, I think we were talking about when I first came to the center. Let me write some of this down. What's the date, Ted? Today's date is January 20th, I think. Two, January 20th. 20. 2012. 1-2. So we met Sue 17 years ago. How'd we meet? Playing basketball. Playing basketball, yeah. Good memory. And you said you, you admired my uh, basketball playing skills and you invited me to come <laughs> to, your cent to your center. <laughs> what do you think about the work, Ted? Unlike many other places where people work with kids, uh, there seemed to be a, a heavy influence on how we could care for each other. The Young and Children's Center is essentially an after-school program. We try and cover all the bases. We try and do everything for them so that when we send them home to the parents at night, their homework's done, it's been checked, it's perfect. They've learned something beyond their homework out of our own curriculum. They've had uh, you know, plenty of time to run around and play and have been served a meal. I came when I was a kid. My children came as a kid, now my grandchildren are coming. I would describe this place as a home. First time I came in here, where they said I Sue Ducky, I thought they were talking about Ducky Donuts. <laughs> a lot of people come to us through word of mouth. Uh, we don't advertise, we're just in the community. We've been here for uh, 51 and a half years, and people know about us, and so they just come in and See if we have slots, and on a good day, we do. S, is st S stands for successful. U stands for understanding for understanding for all um, situations. E stands for very strict. Thank you very much, Sue. The first time I met Sue, I thought she was crazy. <laughs> when I first started coming to the center, I hated it. I hated it. Pick it up. Pick it up. I used to think that she was the meanest person on earth. Like, she would yell at you for everything. As a kid, when you grow up, sometimes you want to do things your way. And Sue, when you were her center, you ain't doing nothing your way. We wanted to come at first because we didn't know the whole routine of do your homework first and then you go to the gym or you can get a snack if this and that. Like You're only rewarded by doing what she says. So it was like, you know what, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> you always had to do all this work. She would take away my gym time. Write down number one. If you don't say the name of your school clearly, you don't go to gym. What is your school, Jeremy Hunter? Rabbit. Spell it. All the rules that Sue had, we all following. Where to begin? <laughs> okay. Rule number one. <laughs> you have to tuck in your shirt. She's obsessed with that. I hated that rule a lot because it messes up your outfit. Tie their shoes. Lift them pants up. Oh yeah, you can't wear skirts either. Don't scratch your nose. You don't scratch your head. Those are signs of hostility. You always have to fold your hands, and I find myself doing that a lot. 
put your feet together, can't separate your legs. Make sure you make eye contact or else it would be rude. What's your name, sir? For you? Go shake hands with Santa and say thank you, Santa. Thank you. No, look him in the eye. Thank you, Santa. You're welcome. Don't ever waste any type of food at all because the people in Africa who are starving would appreciate if you ate all your food. I remember I had to eat my, the end of my bread. Oh, I didn't like that part. Don't eat too much, though. She said, your shirt ain't tacking in. You don't come here tomorrow. I disagree with that, but I say, okay, so say you can't come tomorrow, you can't come tomorrow. So if you do something bad, like, you, see you have your hand raised while she's talking, she'll give you a bad point. But it, if you keep doing it, you will have to write a story. And no one wants to do that. Name and date, number down, number your pages. Jamarco, sit back. That's one bad point. As you get older, the complexity of the rules sort of, you know, hits you and you're like, oh, I know why I have to have eye contact. Now, yeah, it all makes sense. It taught us like self-control. Sue instilled that <laughs> in all her kids. Like, you're gonna learn or you can't be a part of it. Ten dollars an hour. Write down ten, ten dollars an hour. Monday I work five hours. So wait a minute. Wait. I got little kids here. If she worked five hours on Monday, what's five times ten? Fifty. Write down fifty dollars. Two hours on Tuesday. If she worked two hours. Twenty. Seven. Good. Uh, uh, <laughs> Terrific. Go ahead. Eight hours on Friday. Eighty. Eighty. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Add them up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she loves me. You so annoying. My baby is 17 now. And before she turned 17, she just wanted to be with me so much. Mind you, she turned 17 January 2nd, and here it is January 10th. You see how much she loves me? She loves me. Ma, stop. Describe your mom. <laughs> That's a hard one, Mel. She's loud. <laughs> She's really loud. <laughs> Where y'all going? Huh? If you can hunt, you can hear. You guys need to tuck your shirts. Everybody is not listening. I have five children that have attended the Children's Center. Serenity is the youngest. Serenity is what we call the popular nerd. My winter break is gonna be reading these books. Right now at the center, I supervise kids pre-K through second grade. Let me tell you something. We can do the brown blocks, but everybody that touches them brown blocks have to put them up. At the front desk, I'm security. Uh, Heather to John and 206. The center was back and forth between a couple churches in the beginning. And then in 2003, we moved here to Jackie Robinson School. The Oakland neighborhood where we're based now is still 99% African American. Uh, it's one of the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. Right now I have 111 kids on the books. Our uh, youngest is two. Uh, our oldest child is 19. We do very, very intense academic work. I mean, kids get drilled in academics here. We cover all subjects. This year we got a lot of kids who really could have used our program years ago, but the system just kind of passed them along, so to speak. And now they're here and we're trying to help them get back what they should have had a long time. That's probably the most difficult part is not being able to help everybody. See, the problem is you've, you've crossed out all your letters so you can't see what you're doing. Let's write them big here. Genetics. Kids that stick with us for just a, a single full year uh, usually come up to about a B average. Kids that stick with us for three years, usually by that point at least two-thirds are on honor roll. And kids that stick with us through high school, 100% graduate high school, 100% every single one for years. 
and they all go on to college, every single one. Good. Maybe I said it, one of us said it, but we were talking about how, in some ways, we're always sort of reliving our childhood, right? I think, isn't it? Just the, the, the... How we were molded. Yeah. My childhood home. Does that look a little different from this? <laughs> grew up in Winchester, Massachusetts. My father was a great athlete. We were surrounded by a golf club, so we played all sorts of sports and flooded the land behind our house so we could skate and play hockey in the winter and ski. I was a troubled little girl, and people were good to me and taught me. Dad hired a young black woman named Eva Guy to help mother with the four children. He was extraordinarily kind to me. My father worked in finance and was able to give me a, a trust fund, which I can live off. Went to Smith College for four years in Northampton, Massachusetts, majoring in English. Married Mr. Duncan and moved to Chicago and taught. I gave birth to three biological children, and they came with me to my various schools. <laughs> In June 61, a pastor friend asked me to come to teach Bible school. He gave me nine young black girls age nine, so we passed the Bible around and have each kid read a few sentences. None of them could read. Started the center just then. If I could learn to read, why not everybody else in the world? I've been running the Children's Center without pay for 50 years. The neighborhood was, it was okay. I mean, it was a working class neighborhood at the time that we were growing up. And progressively it got worse uh, as different things were introduced into the neighborhood, you know, the, the more uh, illicit drugs like the crack cocaine and things like that. We were constantly as kids and as teenagers navigating the streets to to make sure that um, there wasn't uh, some um, approaching danger. I don't know a kid growing up who wasn't robbed at gunpoint, wasn't robbed at knife point uh, by an older uh, uh, young adult. Grew up uh, in housing projects not too far from where Sue has her center now. My mother would leave and go to the store and uh, she would come back out of breath because a lot of times she would have to run because they were shooting. It was pretty strange, you know, this lady coming into this neighborhood just all by herself, you know, and just being, you know, for lack of a better term, just being like a foreigner coming into a foreign land, you know. They weren't used to seeing, you know, a white lady with three little white kids coming to a, a predominantly black neighborhood three days a week. We always had a, a big blue truck, a big blue van, and mother would pick us up after school and we would drive and pick up a bunch of other kids on the way to the center. And then when uh, Sue probably drove about three miles an hour on a good day and it was very, very slow getting there, but she was always hyper uh, concerned about uh, not hurting somebody. It was just, I think like awe and amazement, like this white lady got out of her car and walked down this block in this neighborhood. Is she crazy? Maybe every one or two months, my mom would get pulled over by a cop in the neighborhood. You know, lady, are you lost? People really couldn't figure it out for a long time. Being a white person who was not a cop or a social worker or a teacher who wasn't going into the neighborhood for a paid job, she was voluntarily coming in the neighborhood to hang out with kids and help kids. I didn't know growing up what a unique experience it was. This was all I knew, <laughs> so it just was normal. This was my life, this is what we did. Um, we lived in a very affluent, uh, mostly white, highly educated uh, neighborhood in Chicago, and then we crossed this invisible line. For all those years, 47th Street with this huge uh, dividing line this, and a uh, huge barrier between the High Park community and North Carolina, Oakland. 
after a while, people started to accept her. And so when they saw her blue van coming down the street to pick us up to take us to the church, it was like, here comes Sue, here comes Sue. I met Sue when I was playing basketball at the University of Chicago. She used to actually go, Sue used to actually go play in pickup games at the university. Um, she'd be the only woman playing, probably the only person even close to her age playing. I remember coming out of Sunday school and I remember seeing all these kids playing at this facility that was adjacent to the church and it looked really fascinating. So I remember sneaking into the center a few times and it was really crowded and Sue was just sort of saying, no, 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 there's not enough room. But I sort of became a fixture at the center. Being able to, to walk into the center and see all of the things that you were able to do, all of the games and the toys and things that you were able to, to play with, all the bookshelves covered with books and all of the, uh, you know, the flashcards that she had and, you know, being able to have the apples and the oranges. My first impression was, wow. Once you got there, you know, the first day, you wanted to be there every day. Sue had a schedule. It was a routine. You come in, we do homework, we do vocabulary, we do geography, we do math, we do reading. We interview people that would come in. She introduced new things that we didn't learn at school. Sue would sit near the, the, the beginning of the circle and she would always ask how everybody was doing at home and how their life was and she would ask how school was. When you're in, in, in lines or roles, it just seems kind of regimented. And a lot of times children don't pay attention, you wind up going to sleep. But if you sit in a circle, it's kind of like family-like. She would never get physical or anything like that. She would just tell you simply to go home. And that was the worst thing she could do. And especially when you were young, you know, because you went home and you were basically the only kid at home. Everybody else was at Sue. <laughs> so you never wanted to go home. Her whole philosophy was that 10-year-olds taught 15-year-olds and 15-year-olds taught 10-year-olds. I had this fondness for mathematics and it was clear that a lot of the kids needed help. So that was one of the things that I focused on. I kind of learned uh, math just kind of hanging around Carrie. You know, I would sit there and wait for one of my friends to be tutored. So I would uh, listen to Carrie explain math to him. Sue had known me pretty much all my life. She increasingly started asking if I could do this, if I could do that. And one of the things she asked is if I could start balancing the checkbook. As you start to, to get a little bit older, you know, um, you know, maybe nine or ten, you know, you, it becomes this place where you realize that your life is being enriched. You, you start to understand that all these flashcards are to help you learn because when you go back to school the next day and the teacher is asking you about a lesson and you know it and the rest of the kids don't, then you start realizing, hey, this is not bad. There was also field trips and the field trips were not constant, but they were occasional. It was something always to look forward to, like a circus, or uh, going to a movie, or going to the beach. She took us to the back of the Museum of Science and Industry. She would take us to have lunch and bring us back home. And then there were the uh, extended uh, field trips, something probably unheard of today, which as a kid we would go to a place like Montana where we would visit a family, stay with a family for a couple of weeks. That was just a glorious uh, experience to, uh, to first you know, actually live outside of uh, the city, to live in a rural community, to live in a uh, house. I went to Sturgis, Michigan, and they had like uh, summer homes on the lake. It was night and day from my neighborhood. You got to see how other people live, and not just that area that you came from. You know, there's, there's people that I grew up with to this day that won't leave the neighborhood. And it's just basically because of the fear of what they're going to encounter when they leave that neighborhood. Well, she took that away at a young age. There were times when, you know, gang members would come up to the, come up to the center and they want, you know, they demanded to come in. And it was interesting because Sue would stand her ground and she wouldn't let them come in. The neighborhood did infiltrate the center. I can remember one experience where um, there were some young men that were having a disagreement and there was a gun brought into the center. Um, 
at, the only reason I believe that nothing bad happened is because of the respect that the people in the neighborhood had for the center. So they didn't take it any further. But I can remember Sue being hurt. I mean, extremely, extremely hurt. One of my earliest memories was when the Blackstone Rangers firebombed the first uh, church we started at, and I must have been five or six, and the uh, Rangers wanted to turn the church into an arsenal. Um, the minister wouldn't let them do it, so they firebombed it. Uh, luckily, thankfully, they didn't do it while we were there. Um, but I remember sort of walking down the street with crates of books and moving to, to, uh, to the Kenwood Ellis Church. They said they were going to lock the door of the church where I was in to teach, not to pray. And they were gonna set the church on fire. I had several suggestions of torture and mayhem. But I kept coming down, I don't know why. You know, here's this lady coming through the neighborhood, right? And she's fearless. As a matter of fact, if one of those guys was walking down the street and she needs some help, she'd go, hey, come over here and help me. <laughs> you know what I mean? She gained respect because she was never intimidated. She was just steady. So the gym is downstairs, right? Okay. The last time I came here, I walked in. And she was looking at me, and I did like this. She said, Chucky Edwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much funny. <laughs> Robert you know. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know who R. Kelly was until <laughs> one of my roommates happened to be listening to BET or something like that. I looked, I said, That's Robert Kelly. I know him. <laughs> I used to teach him how to read. Michael, I mean, he was always a gentle person. Yeah. But he, I mean. How did he become a bodyguard? Oh, I know. Yeah. I used to protect him. Yeah. <laughs> it's to keep people from, from fighting, Michael. <laughs> I never saw him have a fight in his life. No. I brought my two kids to the center, and all the same vocabulary words are still there, all those same packages and man, all the, used to do World they're War II. still there. You Blitzkrieg, know? All Lightning that stuff War. is still there, man. And I was, I was telling them, I was like, man, I used to work on these things when I was younger than you guys, you know, and it's, all this stuff is still here. <laughs> First time I met Sue, my kids had went to the center without my permission. I had been drinking a little bit, found out where they were, went down there and got them. And she was like, no, you're not taking these kids. I'm like, what do you mean? They're my kids. <laughs> she was like, leave them. I'll bring them home, you know. And I went home. I left them. And they, they continued to attend the center without me for a little while. After a while, I started to come with them. Good night, Sue. From birth on up, Serenity's been there since she was in the womb. She started coming at two weeks old. Her first steps were at the center. Her first words were at the center. She learned how to read at the center, learned how to write at the center. You know, she was Sue's baby. I encourage mothers to bring their children as babies to the center because the first five years are critical in a child's intellectual and social physical development and serenity is a jewel as is her mother and all her other siblings and she'll be playing pro ball in a little while but she's uh, she's not my own child really that's always what sue told us she's like if you haven't tried it yet you don't know if it's bad so like, I didn't want to take French because I was like, that's a dumb language. And I wanted to take Spanish because, you know, that's what I've always learned since third grade. But Sue was like, try something different. So I took French, and I love French. Even though it's a hard class, I love it. There was alcohol in my life, drugs in my life. 
I say a year after I started attending the center, there was a situation where I was told, you get yourself together or all your kids are gone. I went into treatment and my sister kept my kids, Sue paid the rent, and picked my kids up on a daily basis. And when I came home, I think it was three months later, I attended the center and did what I needed to do. All right, we're gonna have one song from Mary. This is the day. This is the day. Everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. She changed my whole attitude about learning. She taught me that it's always better to, you know, push yourself. Try it for me. I don't like chances. Try it. Try it. Sure. Have you ever felt that there was someone that you weren't able to help? Or some people that, like... Well, some people drop out. Some people go back to the gangs and guns. And... But if any child wants to learn how to read or write, I haven't had a child who I couldn't teach. Good seeing you. Happy birthday. You know what, Cashman, KJ, I don't know what's going on with them. My Lil J is still here. Cashman, KJ, they gone. They lost their head. Look, five times five. Key. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. I was locked up for six months. And then I got put on house rest for three. When I got in high school, I got I got more into girls. I got more into going out buying my own clothes and not having my parents shop for me. At the time, I was too young to get a job, so I got with a couple of my friends and we came up with a stupid, stupid idea. Our plan was to rob every drug dealer in Kenwood. We made a lot of money for the time being, but when I look back on it, I have no money now. Half those friends, either locked up or dead, and I'm still here on, pro on probation, like, messed up. And right down Chicago. Chicago is a city. How many young black men were killed in Chicago last year? Aaron? The total is 598. It was 600. Why are we killing our young black men in our city, Jamarco? Write down drug wars. How many, hey, come here, Jeremy. How many years have I been running the center? 45. 40, almost 44. Be 44 in June. Write down 44 years. How many of my kids have been killed? I don't know the number. How many of my kids are in jail now? As a man in my neighborhood, I was always around violence. It's normal. Like you, you, you become immune to it. My name is Jasmine Freeman. I am 16 years old and I have been attending the center for about 13 years now. Well, I have seven siblings, but 
um, we were adopted and between two aunts. Uh, Ali was like the glue in our family. So whenever a big decision had to be made, Aunt Ali always had the final say. Um, she came mostly every day. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Why do I look new? Because I haven't seen you in a while. My mother used to always say, what are you going to do when I'm gone? You know, but you never really think about it until it actually happens. I don't know. It was just, it was something major. And it was so sudden. It was like going from a normal day to hell. <laughs> I just didn't believe it. Sue became more of a, a, a getaway for uh, my siblings. She would say she loves us 24-7, and she knew we needed that, and it helped a lot. She was actually at the funeral in a dress, which I've never seen before in my life. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? My name is May Isifu. I've been going to Sue Duncan Children's Center for nine years now. This okra stew I made, I always like that with some fish heads. Oh, you had to tell me. I was born in Ghana. I came to the U.S. when I was six years old because Mama wanted better education for me. From my religion and my tribe, they believe it that girls shouldn't get educated. So most part, the men was, the boys was the one always in school, but the girls, we usually was home helping our parents. I wasn't able to read pretty well when I got there. I can't help them with their homework. And school nowadays, you need someone to help you. you she will assign me to one student who will help me and gave me a book so we begin reading a little at a time. I just want to have some knowledge, something, you know, that I could fall back into. You know, I want to complete my reading. I want to be able to see something and just read it and just get it. Oh my God, I was so bad. I used to, Sue used to tell me, young lady, sit down. I was like, no, I'm going to my mama. I'm tired of this. I had t t um, temper tantrum. I was just out of control. You fear her, but yet, you know, she, you, it's like she whooping you butt with words. When, it was with my last report card and Sue told me, oh, homo, how could you get D's and F's? And she would just look at me and just shake her head. And when she looked at me, I knew this lady had ambition in me. She saw more than me than I saw in myself. So I was like, so I'm a change. From that day, I went to school. I didn't care what the kids said about me. I sat in front of the classroom instead of the back. I interact with my peers. If I didn't understand anything, I raised my hand and asked. I finally broke out of my shell, my shyness, you know, so shy. I broke out. Is today? Is it Friday? Thursday? Wednesday? Tuesday? Saturday. Saturday. Wow, close. 
only missed it by five. Saturday, so there's no Sue Duncan today, good. One day my uh, young daughters were here. They had gone outside with Sue and a bunch of younger children, and one of them showed up back in the room while I was teaching a lesson. And uh, I said, you know, hi, who brought you upstairs? Because kids are supposed to be supervised. And she said, nobody. So I left the classroom unattended, went racing out there and found that uh, Sue had left about 30 kids unattended out there and set for a uh, teenage visitor. Something my mom would never, ever have done. My mom was the quintessential safety freak. So at that point, I knew that something seismic had happened. I guess it started like a year ago when I actually started to notice things. She would forget people's names that had been common to Sue for a long, long time, every day. Can you spell your first name, please? It, it just got worse and worse as time went by. It was kind of awkward when I did start to realize, like, she's not remembering basic things or uh, during a group she'll be she'll repeat several of the same things I didn't see it coming I just thought Sue was too strong of a person like oh she's not gonna forget anything it's Sue like come on she knows everything in the world to see her you know and talk to her and then go through the whole thing all over again. It, it just hurts, it's just hard. Really? There's no other way to put it. For a while, Sue was basically double staffed. If I, if I wasn't with her personally, I had two staff members with her because she would always find some excuse to get rid of one because she didn't like being nursemaided. <laughs> and they were under fairly strict orders to never leave her alone with kids. Not that she was in any sense a danger to the children herself, but that she sometimes did just forget what she was doing or wander away. But we owed it to Sue to give her as long here as possible because she wanted to be here, because she founded it, because she loved it, because everybody here loved her. Let me get my hug before you go home. Sue, you're going to make me cry. My family and I go to her house like, every night just to check up on her. She remembers us. She remembers the center. She would ask about some of the kids here. And every day she would ask, is there a suit tomorrow? Like, you would see little notes taped on her wall and on her dresser saying, call Owens to pick me up at 3.30 to come to the center.
showed up at the Christmas party, I cried. Like, I had to run to the bathroom. Because <laughs> just her face, when she saw those kids, it was just like the biggest smile you can ever see. You could tell that she missed being here. It was like she was a celebrity, like Reggie Bush. And Reggie Bush just walked in, everyone just like ran towards her and was screaming. It was nice because we hadn't seen her for like four months, I believe. I was like pulled into the reality that Sue isn't going to be here forever. I know that this is something that if she had a choice, she would do for like the rest of her life. Sue used to always say, do you want an A life or a B life? So even though a B is good, it just kind of made you sit down and think, like, I, I can get an A life if I want to. She was always really present, you know? And I think that, I think in a parent, that's really what a lot of our kids crave, and I think that's why kids gravitate to her. She's really present to where they are emotionally and ready to listen and hear and share in that way. After a while, I became more open to her. I told her this is how I feel, how, how I didn't know my father, how, you know, and she saying, don't worry, it's, it's okay. And she, she, she not only listened, she cried as I was talking to her, made me feel like I wasn't alone. I could just talk to her, I could tell her anything, and you know, she'd like, not give me the answer, but tell me, you know, give me, lead me in a direction. I now look up to her as like, a part of my family. Lots of thanks to. But with a smile, it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. See what you bring out, Mel? <laughs> I care for you. Do you know that? Yes. I've cared for you since your mother brought you. In a box. In a box. As a baby. Yes. <laughs> she had that, that revered space, you know, in your mind and in your heart because she was, she was held in that high regard. You never wanted to disappoint her. You know, you never wanted to let her down because she never let you down. For most of us that grew up in that neighborhood and went to that center, that place was a lifesaver. I really, and I say it all the time, Sue saved lives. She saved lives. If you're not used to people loving you, then you'll have a hard time adjusting to life at the center because that's all you get here is love from everyone. You can very quickly clue into where the child is and what the child's needs are. What they really need is consistent behavior and no violence. That's what we all need. Love the children. Care for the children. Care for their parents. Be very consistent very honest, very open, works. You know, I would have never uh, imagined the life I have now when I was at the center. I always felt that I would do, uh, do okay. I live in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area now with, uh, with my family, my wife and two kids. I work for a very large technology company today, IBM. A smarter planet is built with smarter computing. I'm an IBMer. Let's build a smarter planet. You know, so within the IBM world, I'm a master inventor. I've got a lot of patents. I've traveled to over 50 countries. Absolutely, I would, uh, I would say, but for the center, I would have not achieved the results that I've achieved today. So I pretty much taught around different schools here in North Carolina. And each time I, I would leave a school to go somewhere else to teach, I noticed that the students began to follow me. And then eventually, I decided, well, I'll open up my own. If you notice, we kind of do the circle when we do uh, exercises. Students are required to bring me grades. They know if the grades go down, they're going to get tutored. Uh, 
uh, by me. They don't really like it because I'm kind of like Sue and uh, I'm strict with them. And... <laughs> She's like almost a third parent to me. Basically. I saw the power of education and I came to see in my own mind that the dividing line in our country was almost less around race and class than it was around education opportunity. Probably the most important opportunity I had was the, the most formative was the first 10 years of my life growing up as a part of my mother's inner city tutoring program. What compelled my mother to take her three young children into this community every single day and to face those kinds of challenges? I think the answer is pretty simple but also profound. They did this work every single day simply because this work was so important and because this work is bigger than all of us. If you go to a neighborhood like North Kenwood, Oakland, which is desperately poor, 100% black, and provide great educational opportunities, those kids can go on to do extraordinary things. And my whole goal in life from then has been to try and create more opportunities for kids like those I grew up with so that they can be as successful. Mel, you better get that thing off of me. <laughs> Mary Hughes is an enormous part of the heart of the center. Someone that completely shared Sue's vision. And they both have a certain presence with children. There was no one, obviously, who could do it Sue's way, and if anyone can, Mary can, and that's what she's doing. One, We all were children. We all were illiterate, didn't have skills, scared, had some talents, some not. Needed to do this work for my own self. And if she's not kind, what is she? Okay. Okay, Unkind me. is a good word. We all are born with potential. Do what we can with the time we have. We all die right now. We haven't wasted our lives. Thank you, sweetheart. Yeah. So what do you want to do with your life? Thank the Lord. I've been praying for this iPod. I'm a for Thank about the three Lord. Months. Thank you again.
Hey, Galisa. They videotaping you for a movie. I'm a movie star. Sue Duncan life. 